Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Justin Paperni and I'm the director of Prison Professors and White Collar Advice. All of my videos are important, I think, uh, but today is, is feels different to me in part because of the relationship I've cultivated with my good friend and client, Learned Jay Hand, who's with us uh, today. We've worked extensively for, I guess, going on a year and a half now, and he's ending his journey through the criminal justice system, at least the sentencing phase. And it's just a privilege for me to welcome him to our show. So Learned, welcome to the White Collar Advice channel. And if you would give us a couple of minutes on who you are and uh, why you're going to be surrendering to federal prison here soon. Oh, gosh. You know, we started a, a business back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you, you do a startup, you make a thousand decisions. And mm -hmm. I made some great ones. I made some bad ones. Mm -hmm. And I trusted people I shouldn't have. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, 2016, they came knocking on my door and arrested me uh, and uh, started the process mm -hmm. of being prosecuted. And um, how did you know, they? I made some bad. How, how how did they arrest you? Was did did uh, you get a target letter in the mail? Did they show up with guns blazing? What was the process to arrest you? Oh, I was actually uh, dropping off my children at their mother's house. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, um, and they they were waiting. I a, yeah, I got half a block away, and they just sort of swarmed the car and. And, you know, they, they were aggressive, but they were professional. Mm -hmm. And after the, after the initial stop, they were, they were fine. And I was taken into custody and then arraigned the next day and then bailed out and then, you know, retained counsel uh, in Boston. And, um, so let, let, me ask two, let me ask two thoughts on that. One, I've had clients who were arrested who had no idea why they were being arrested. Others knew something was up, wondering if the feds were coming. When you were arrested, were you a little taken aback? What were your thoughts? Were you confused, or did you know it was a matter of time? Uh, I, I was taken aback. Uh, a family member had been uh, taken in some months beforehand, and mm -hmm. I had uh, uh, dealings with, with that family member. So I knew uh, things were set in motion. I didn't know if I was going to be pulled into it. But I was. Uh, I became a co-conspirator. Yes, I too was a co-conspirator. We're co-conspir co-conspirators. So let's talk about hiring a lawyer. You don't have to get into it extensively. I'm always intrigued when I speak with potential clients and clients about their process of retaining a lawyer. I frequently had people tell me my lawyer's awful, and I'll say, I know that lawyer. He's a fantastic lawyer. Let me tell you why. The flip side of defendants have said, I think I have a great lawyer and I ask why and they cannot articulate why. So can you quickly tell viewers how you chose, you don't have to say who they are, but how you chose this legal team and what vetting process did you go through? So there is a, a list of uh, the top, you know, white collar defense uh, lawyers in every particular area. Mm -hmm. I spoke to a few firms Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was uh, very pleased with the firm I, I chose and, and have been. They've been mm -hmm. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good sized firm. Uh, the attorney was very experienced, had mm -hmm. been in the U.S. Attorney's Office and uh, did an incredible job, an incredible job mm -hmm. um, of just, just navigating through the system. As I wrote about in, in Lessons from Prison, and as you know, through our conversations, I was in uh, denial at first, didn't fully accept responsibility for my conduct, and I made matters worse. From the beginning, did you own it? Did you talk about it? Or did you need help understanding how your conduct could have been perceived criminally by the government? Great question. Um, Thank you. You know, initially, initially you're, you're in denial. Mm -hmm. No, I had no malice of forethought. Mm -hmm. I, I meant no harm. I thought I was doing the right thing, so, so on and so forth. And, you know, when someone walks you through this scenario, it's a lot easier to connect the dots of, of prior actions. <laughs> yeah. So, well, it looks like this and this. Well, I could see that. You know what? What I did was wrong. Yeah. I made some bad decisions. And look, look let's get right down to it. You know, I can fight this 
if I had more money. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's almost impossible to fight something. You know, you have $3 million to fight this and maybe lose, or, you know, do you want to spend seven fifty dollars to uh, be mm -hmm. guilty? Yeah. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, I, it's not even really a choice. A video I film, I'm not saying you're innocent. I know you accepted responsibility. You didn't have intent, but that video I filmed, the why innocent white collar defendants plead guilty. It's part of that reason, right? The odds of prevailing are so low. And even if you do, you've blown through everything. And if you lose, they're going to give you a sentence that's 10 years when it could have been three. So it's just, it's not really, it's not even truly a consideration. So let's harken back a bit to when you, reached out to me. If I recall, you were familiar with my work for a little while and, uh, and Michael Santos and me. Um, after you were aware of our work, did you immediately reach out? Did you take some time? I know we spoke several times before you ultimately hired me. I encourage you to do your due diligence, speak to other clients of mine. So walk us through that process when you truly began to prepare. And I guess, how long were you aware of, of my work? So I was into the process a good nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, it had never occurred to me that there was uh, a consultants like yourself out there. Mm -hmm. I was uh, strictly going off what my attorney was telling me and giving me good advice, but I had a lot of difficulty in the process. You know, I thought my world was over, my life was, was ending. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I read something Googled you, watched a couple videos of yours, and um, immediately I had a lot of questions answered, uh, and I gave you a call. Uh, there was a couple other people I called as well. Uh, we hit it off pretty well. I watched a lot of your videos mm -hmm. and Michael Santos' videos, and we had some really constructive conversations. You helped me a lot even before I was a client. Well, I remember, I remember you saying something on our first call. You said sometimes in the past, I said you shouldn't retain us until you reviewed our scope of work. And I'm happy to do a payment plan over many, many months to confirm that we're delivering. And you said, Justin, I like that because sometimes I jump right in. And I said I was the same way. I was easily exploited when I was a defendant because someone said they could help me. I just pulled out the credit card and I'm like, just swipe the city card. I got a lot of credit. Help me. And... And I said, you know, take your time. Let's talk again and again and again. And then by the time we worked together, it was just sort of a formality that we would. But offer some advice to defendants who are nervous and scared, who may be getting conflicting opinions from consultants, from, from lawyers, who want to prepare but don't know how. You took your time, and I think that was to your benefit. You know, uh, that's so true. It, it's like a fellow who's fallen in a hole, and a doctor comes by, to help him and he writes him a prescription and throws the note in. Then an attorney comes by mm -hmm. and writes a memo and a brief mm -hmm. and throws it in. Yep. And then Justin comes along <laughs> and said, jumps in the hole with me. <laughs> and I said, now we're both stuck. And he says, no, 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 I've been down here. I know the way out. Yep. And help me out of that hole mm -hmm. because that's the worst part of this process. You're stuck in this hole yep. and everybody thinks they can help you, but no one's really been down there before. And uh, that's professional, intelligent, knows what they're doing and delivers. So, so let's re reflect back on some choices you began to make, some good choices you made as you were traversing this process. And then I'd like to talk about how you did it despite some very difficult complexities in your life with family and work and health. So what were some good choices you began to make as you approached your sentencing? So the most, most important um, step I took throughout this process was to get out of my own head, mm -hmm. to quit the uh, pity party that was going on mm -hmm. and, and started to take some action. Mm -hmm. Then getting out of the house, mm -hmm. uh, exercising, going to the gym, uh, start, I started to take care of myself because yeah. now, after working with you, I saw the process as one that I could manage. Mm -hmm. I can't, there will be an end, this will be over, and mm -hmm. I can either be a better person from this or I can just blow my brains out. Yeah. Uh, knowing that there was an end date and a process to go through and the steps that should be taken to mitigate my, my sentence and literally my mental uh, state, my survival yeah. uh, were laid out. So let's take that first step. Now the second step, 
Um, and I got very active uh, in volunteering. Mm -hmm. uh, in a two-year period, I volunteered 375 days. Yep. Uh, well, that, that actually I leads, so, so you're going to, Jay's going to speak with a couple of clients this week before he surrenders to Butner Federal Prison Camp. It's on the 25th, correct? This Thursday? Yeah. This Thursday. And Jay was looking at a sentence up to, to 60 months in prison. More realistic, might have been 33 to 41 months. He was ultimately sentenced to nine months in prison. And on a group coaching call last week, uh, Jay spoke and a number of clients afterwards said, wow, great story and experience, very positive and upbeat. And by the way, how did he only get nine months when he was looking at 60? And then Jay wrote a blog that I'll put a link to, a blog on our website. And in that blog, you speak about the work, the volunteering, de detailing cars in, in, in the hot North Carolina heat and losing weight, continuing to get treatment for substance abuse, counseling or whatever it is it might be. So what I think you did well, and it kind of comes back to a book I encouraged you to read, which I sent to you, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. That book talks a great deal about doing things on day, you doing preparing on days you don't want to, that everybody talks about it. Not everyone follows through. So for those defendants, there are defendants watching who are in a situation that you're in, that I was once in, who at times it's tough to muster the strength to get out of bed, to shave, to shower, to even look for a job. Isn't that what you did well? Didn't you force yourself to do things on days maybe you didn't want to? I think that's what separates you. Yes, and it's, import it's an important distinction. The difference between motivation and discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, you only become motivated if you're disciplined to do it when you don't, when you absolutely cannot do it. Yep. Um, but so it was sort of like discipline. You have to, you know, I have two young children. I'm up at five in the morning to get them off to school. Um, but it was, it, I, I, I remember the first day I walked from the gym after talking to you and I saw somebody I knew and I, I couldn't, I could barely speak to them. I was yeah. so out of it. I was so wrecked. Yeah. Um, but, you know, day in and day out, putting on your shoes in the morning is the hardest thing mm -hmm. about going to the gym. And so it was that, and things became easier when I, if I couldn't, you know, so there are going to be days when you're not going to want to get out of bed. Yeah. You know, so this one fellow I was talking to, I said, go out, take a shower, get in your car and drive two miles and come home. You'll have a different perspective. Yeah. Get out of the house. Do something doesn't matter what you do, and as uh, you know, your challenges become greater. And pretty, pretty quite quickly, I was volunteering, mm -hmm. um, running a helpline, mm -hmm. uh, counseling people, um, uh, and working. And a, and the, pretty much the only job I could get, and a job that was a lot of penance. You know, yeah. detailing cars. I'm 60 years old with health issues, and I'm in the 95 degree heat detailing mm -hmm. cars. I did it when I was 17. Now I'm back doing it. But you know, I hated it, but I loved every minute of it because I was doing something that got me out of my head. Well, uh, that, I, it, at night, I felt better. And not only did, did you do it, you said, I'm going to fly out from North Carolina to see you in Los Angeles and we're going to spend a day together. And when I visit, I want to talk to you about some specific goals I have for prison. And when we did meet, you hadn't been sentenced yet. There was no format. It wasn't for, a formality. You were going to go to prison. But when we did meet, you had begun to articulate and write out what some of these goals were, which I think shows how forward thinking you are. And as I as I tried to be, as any defendant should be, because like you said, ex at some point, this experience is going to end. And for those defendants watching, we beg you, don't let this experience turn out to be a life sentence. Learning only got, you know, nine, nine months. He's not letting it become a life sentence. I only got sentenced 18 months, but the three and a half years before I went away, it was a tragedy the way I lived. So I feel like I served five years. So let's transition as we discussed when we met in Calabasas, if you ever go to prison, what some of those goals are. What are some of your goals for the nine months that you're going to be in Butner Federal Prison Camp? You know, I think everybody has the same goals ultimately in life, and that's to be physically and spiritually healthier mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, figure out who we really are. Um, I would have felt gypped if I hadn't got prison time now. <laughs> Could you to be honest, because it completes the whole cycle. 
Yeah. Um, I was hoping for home confinement. Sure. Uh, and we believe we were going to get it mm -hmm. uh, for all the, the work I had done to deserve a, a mm -hmm. lesser sentence, but I got nine months. Uh, you know, some people pay a lot of money to go to an ashram or a monastery for nine months, and their only job in the world is to focus on their own development. I don't have to answer phones, answer texts, answer emails, pay bills, do nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do anything but focus on myself. So I started to put together this plan I'm in pretty good shape. I have some health issues mm -hmm. and I'm 60 years old, but I could be in better shape. Mm -hmm. So what are the specific things I want to do physically? What are the specific things I want to do through guided meditation and readings mm -hmm. for my spiritual life? And what are all these books I want to read? So I've been practicing that plan mm -hmm. uh, before I actually report. I've been working with uh, Matthew. Matt Hagee. Yep. Matt, Matt yeah. for those watching, Matt Hagee is the fitness coach and health coach for white collar advice clients. I will also be doing a, a video with him and introducing him. But Matt has been working with, with Jay on some of his fitness and health goals and exercise goals in prison. So I could, from the first day, I already have, as I've been doing for three hours every day, yep. I know it's a long time and it's not always exercising. Mm -hmm. But I have an entire yoga routine and guided meditation routine yeah. that I do every day in the morning for three hours. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I don't have to invent it when I get there. Uh, so I physical exercise, meditation for three hours, reading for six hours, and writing for three hours. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good routine. And I think you're there in part because you started early. And let's transition to that for a moment for defendants watching. Something interesting about our case, you chose not to tell your lawyers that you retained me, which happens sometimes. And there was some benefit to that because I think I was guiding you behind the scenes and you were asking questions and holding them accountable in a way, frankly, you never could have on your own. I wrote a lot of emails for you that maybe you'd copy and paste and send and put your own you know, approach to it. But recently I spoke with a defendant who absolutely wanted to move forward, read both of my books. Uh, he's a doctor back east, read both of my books, watched all of my videos, read my blogs, spoke to several clients. I actually connected him with you through text message. He chose not to call you because he spoke to others first, called and said, this is fantastic and great. I want to move forward. And he said, let me just run it by my lawyer. And I said, you can make any decision you like. And he saw the lawyer the next day and the lawyer said, it's just way too early to start. I, I like the consultant idea, good idea. It's way too early to start. And I'm thinking, you've been indicted. It wasn't too early to go through discovery. It wasn't too early for you to scratch a $150,000 retainer check. And is it ever too early to begin to prepare for all of the inevitable obstacles that follow a conviction? So for a defendant that's watching, whose lawyer or family member may be telling them it's too early, can you offer some advice on when a defendant should truly start preparing? If it's with me or with somebody else? You need, you need to retain good legal counsel. Uh, I think there's an argument to call you before retaining legal counsel because you'll, you can help in choosing the right lawyer. I got lucky. Mm -hmm. Not everyone does. I wish I had hired you earlier. I would have saved money, time, worry, stress. I wish I had spoken to you before I interviewed uh, for my PSR, my pre-sentence report. Yep. I wish I could go back. Uh, there's a lot of things you don't want to bring up with uh, that initial interview that I should have and would have helped me. I thought, well, it's immaterial. It's, I don't want them to think badly of me, you know, things that happened when I was young and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, I wish I had. Uh, I subsequently had to bring it up later, mm -hmm. which, which, which got in, but you know, again, it we, we, that was one of the first things we did. We immediately worked to amend and change and work to clarify the PSR. So if God forbid the sentence was longer, you'd have had, it, we, that was the most, pro, or the most important thing we did at the beginning. And we got it done. Um, we were able, we were able to get it done. So I'm just, I'm always interested when defendants say, uh, I, I think I should wait. I'm telling you, I'm 10 years in, 13 years into this journey. And I'm still not even halfway through. It is a long road back. And again, whether it's me or somebody else, the onus is on you to, to begin. I'm just always intrigued when lawyers say it's way too early to begin. I just, or, or somebody else. I just think it's arguably 
the worst advice a defendant could ever receive. It's never, I began preparing for college and kindergarten. I began preparing to play baseball at USC the first time I picked up a baseball bat. I just, the sooner the better. I just, I wanted you to share some thoughts on that. You know, I don't even think the best lawyer are, are not as, they don't have the perspective you have uh, and they don't lay out a nice aerial view that there's going to be a beginning, there's going to be an end, and then your life is going to be reborn. Yep. So let's start thinking about the now. Mm -hmm. Let's start preparing that for the day your probation is over, the day you walk out of that, out of, out of federal prison. Yep. That colors your perspective because Without that, you think this is, this is, a, I don't know when it's going to end and my life is over. Well, let's, let's trans as we wrap up this video, and I'm also going to film a video with Jay upon his release so we can hold him accountable and get an idea of how successful he was in pursuing and achieving his goals in prison. I want to wrap up with, um, why are you doing this video? You know, some people might say, live like the ostrich and bury your head in the sand, lay low live in the shadows, so to speak. Why are you choosing, despite some inevitable negative feedback you're going to get, I mean, when you do this, you're going to get people that say, know your role and you know, shut your mouth, so to speak. So why are no. you choosing to do this? You know, I, I, I take responsibility for the decisions I made. I made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not perfect. Um, the last perfect guy I heard of was we crucified him 2,000 years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. I have, um, I've gained a lot from this whole experience. It's who I am. Mm -hmm. If someone chooses to judge me um, for my actions in the past, so be it. They can. What do, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, so much of your energy in this process goes into, my God, what are people going to think of me? The fact is, people don't think of you. You're not that <laughs> important. You're not. Your, your true friends and the people that love and care about your family, your friends, uh, they know you, and it doesn't make any difference. They're with you. Mm -hmm. I haven't met a single person I've told my story to that has said, I, I can't have anything to do with you. Yeah. They're like, oh, my gosh, tell me about what, you know your journey, and this, yeah. is, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to come out of this and say, but maybe IBM's not going to hire me. Maybe the <laughs> State Department won't hire me. But I think the people I want to work for, I'll say, let's go look at some videos yeah. that I felt. And these are my thoughts. This is what I did. This is my experience. Let's see. I've been tried and tested. I've been through a ringer and I survived. Do you want to hire me or someone who hasn't been tested? You know, it's interesting. When I've spoken at some major investment banks on Wall Street, I've been introduced by the director, whomever introduces me, says, you know, with all that Justin went through as a broker at Bear Stearns and UBS and interning at Goldman Sachs and you know, managing hundreds of millions of dollars and now going to prison, the irony is we can't hire him, but with what he's learned and been through, he's like the ideal person we wish we could hire because he knows the consequences that follow you know, bad behavior or cheating. So it's such an interesting. And then he said, you know, we can pay Justin to, to come and speak. We just can't put him on the payroll. And I said, I'm not available. I don't want to come back work here anyway. It's okay. Let me come for the day and leave. Um, so let's wrap up. You know, it's hard for me to, I shouldn't say hard. I don't really ask for testimonials. It's not my shtick, so to speak. So if you could just quickly summarize, if someone were considering a, a consulting firm, and there are good ones. Um, why someone would consider retaining uh, our team at White Collar Advice? Well, it's a great team uh, with Sean, mm -hmm. Michael, yourself, mm -hmm. uh, Josh. Yep. So many people to call upon. I, you know, I, going through this journey, everything that happened to me in the last two years is magnified by a factor of 10 because you're under so much stress. I must have called you once a week with sort of the catastrophe of the week. I've got this real estate issue. Uh, I'm gonna blow my brains out of this, Justin, you know, hang on. I, I know some people you should talk to. I got that resolved. All these things along the way, your prison consultant, 
you know, part-time psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, and you've been through it, you understand where I am every step of the way, and uh, the totality of, of, of everything you provide made it manageable and changed my perspective and not being uh, uh, a victim or, oh my God, my life is over, but what can we do to um, make this experience beneficial, a good one, and grow from this? Well, you, you've, certainly so, yeah, grow you've certainly grown from it. I've grown from our uh, our friendship, our time together. I've learned a great deal from, from you as well. And our journey doesn't end. You'll be surrendering to the federal prison camp in Butner on Thursday. Within a couple of days, I'll have your email invitation. And of course, we will communicate through email and prepare for the other side, which will be um, halfway house, home confinement and probation and the building or the continued building of the next stage of, of your life. So I'm very grateful that you're willing to speak openly and honestly about your experience. And I'm grateful that we're friends and you choose to let me and our team guide you through this uh, experience. I'm very, um, it's been a privilege for me to help you. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for all your help for, for all of this past year and a half. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay.